Well, hello everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes, but while we're waiting though, uh, I welcome folks to chat in where they're dialing in from today and which organization you're with, if any. We'll start in just a couple of minutes. Hola a todos, bienvenidos. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Um, vamos a empezar en unos momentos, pero si quieren, mientras que estemos esperando, pueden poner en el chat um, quiénes son y sus organizaciones afiliados y de dónde vienen. Gracias. So great. I'm pretty sure I saw a couple of Ohio's in there, Amy. I saw Cleveland. Our native saw, land. Uh, yeah. Florida. <laughs> Kinesa, did you see any Dakotas? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what All a great right. turnout. So cool. Well, hello everyone and happy Tuesday from the JM Kaplan Fund in sunny New York City. First, I wanna introduce the fabulous Allison Rosenblatt. Please wave Allison. Uh, who'll be providing live translation uh, in Spanish for today's session. As she moves to the dedicated channel in just a moment, please click on the globe icon if you prefer to listen in Spanish today. Allison? Sí, muy buenos días y les quiero presentar a Allison. Um, ella va a estar interpretando esta presentación simultáneamente en español. Entonces, ahorita que ella vaya al canal de, de intérprete, van a ver un icono de un globo abajo. Tienen que seleccionar ese globo y seleccionar Spanish para escuchar esta presentación en español. Gracias. Thanks so much, Allison. And thanks to all of you for joining us today for this informational webinar about the 2021 JMK Innovation Prize. My name is Justin, and I'm the program director of the prize. And it's my great pleasure to be joined today by Amy Freitag, the executive director of the JM Kaplan Fund. Hi, everybody. And Tanisa Islam, executive director of South Dakota Voices for Peace. Hi, everyone. Tanisa is a 2019 awardee of the prize, and we're so excited that she's here with us today to share her reflections with you all. So before we dive in, I'd like to go over a couple housekeeping notes related to the webinar technology we're using today. So first, today's webinar is available in Spanish and to access the live translation, please click on the globe icon on the bottom right hand side of the screen. And you've been muted for the duration of the webinar. We've done this to minimize background noise. So instead of speaking, you're encouraged to communicate with us by typing your message in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And to that point, we've reserved ample time at the end of this webinar for questions. But do please feel free to submit your questions to us throughout today's presentation. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but may not get to all of them, seeing as hundreds or perhaps even thousands of people are participating today. So if we fail to get to your question, please email me directly after the webinar. I'll be sure to share, I'll be sure to share my email address throughout today's presentation. And finally, if you need to drop off at some point today, absolutely no worries. A recording of this webinar will be posted to the fund's website within the next couple of business days. So today's webinar is really intended to provide an overview of the JMK Innovation Prize. We plan to introduce the JM Kaplan Fund itself and explain how this prize fits into the fund's broader philanthropic mission. We'll talk about the prize's eligibility criteria, address details of the application and selection processes, and hear from Tuniza about her experience as a recipient of the prize. Finally, we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Please note that in the past, we've conducted an altogether separate webinar for our wonderful 500 plus external reviewers who participate in the prize's signature review process. This is not that webinar. That said, if you're here as a reviewer today, I'd encourage you to stick around for the helpful context. Uh, but please know that we're not going to be digging into the review process today in great depth. So with that, let's begin. Amy? Thanks, Justin. And I'd like to start today by introducing the JM Kaplan Fund, a 75-year-old family foundation based in New York City. On the left is an image of our founder, JM, Jacob Merrill Kaplan, and his wife, Alice. For those of you who are new to the fund, it was JM's extraordinary success as a businessman, especially in the agricultural sector, that resulted in the creation of the fund. 
JM purchased a small struggling grape business in Western New York State and built it into what became known around the world as the Welch's Grape Juice Company. He sold the company to the grape growers, creating an early and important model of cooperative corporate ownership and creating the capital that launched the foundation. JM took on many legendary battles, including the fight to save Carnegie Hall, the first legal protections for homeless in New York City, and the effort to build the new school right here in New York City. And then for three decades after his leadership, the fund was led by Joan Davidson, JM's eldest daughter seen here on the right. Still a legend in New York City at age 93, Joan grew the foundation into a fully staffed grant making enterprise. Joan's passion for all things New York, its environment, its history, and its people led to numerous important early stage grants, including the first grants to create park conservancies like the Central Park Conservancy, the Prospect Park Alliance, and the High Line. Um, she also led the fight to save Broadway theaters and the first green markets in New York City, and along with many, many other innovations. So today, the foundation continues to be led, um, and if uh, we could go to the next slide, by JM's grandchildren, what we call our third generation of family members and leadership of the fund, many of whom are pictured here. Um, they are actively engaged in three areas of grant making, the environment with a focus on climate, social justice with a focus on criminal justice reform, immigration and democracy and heritage conservation, what many would call historic preservation. In 2015, the fund held our inaugural JMK Innovation Prize in honor of our founders' passion and success in investing in early, and out, early stage and outstandingly led innovative projects. And that's what brings us really to today's discussion. So I'm gonna pass the mic back to Justin to talk more about the creation of the prize. Justin? Well, Thank you, Amy. So building on this legacy of smart risk taking, the fund launched the JMK Innovation Prize in 2015 to place informed bets and ideas in their earliest stages of development. We envision making one of the first significant investments in organizations and making the funding multi-year so as to give the founders runway to plan and grow. We also envision providing awardees with the kind of personalized support that most nonprofits don't receive from foundations. And just as importantly, creating a cohort experience where social innovators from across the country can learn from one another. So we were blown away in 2015 when we received more than a thousand applications from 45 US states, as well as Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. We then repeated the prize in 2017 and 2019 and continued to receive more and more applications each prize cycle. So in 2019, we received more than 1,300 applications from all 50 states, as well as from numerous US territories and native tribes. So I'll tell you more about how we review all of these applications and select awardees later on in today's webinar. Amy? So as I mentioned earlier, the fund's grant making focuses on three areas of work. The environment, well, I'll do it in, court, in this order. Social justice, um, buttressing democracy, which is around voter education and voter engagement. We also have a history of working in criminal justice reform and immigration. And in the environment where we're really looking to slow the pace of climate change and mitigating climate impacts. And then finally, in heritage conservation, conserving the places the communities care most about. Um, and we, we fund these topics and, 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 and in each of our traditional sort of, in a traditional way that a foundation would. We have program officers in each of these three areas of work. They work with our trustees to advance grant making strategies and ultimately grant making portfolios. Um, so while the, the, the innovation prize allows us to seek early stage um, innovations in these three areas, they, these, are not, these are not in conflict. We think of the innovation prize as incredibly complementary to our traditional grant making um, efforts and, and really is a way for us to hear from really people closest to the ground. The people are closest to the challenges that are, that are facing our country. By, by doing this through the innovation prize, we get such a tremendous amount of input from 
and people on the ground that are really facing the, the work and doing the work directly. Now, now, one thing I wanna highlight in our prize this year, in the 2021 prize, there's sort of a new piece of our social justice portfolio that we're emphasizing, and that really is the work in democracy, um, specifically reflecting the last 18 months worth of grant making we've been doing C3 grant making to organizations that are supporting our democracy through countering voter suppression, engaging voters and educating voters. And if you wanna learn more about that or any of our grant making, I encourage you to go to our website, click on the What We Fund tab, and in each of these three program areas, you're going to see a PDF that will give you um, direct sort of uh, information on the grants we've been making over the last several years. Now, one thing I want to mention, and I, I, I referenced it earlier, that we make these grants in these three traditional bucket areas. In the Innovation Prize, we say that we're interested in those three bucket areas and in work related to that. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a really good example from our 2019 cohort. We funded a great organization called M Schools and its talented staff provide training to educators and administrators, um, creating really inclusive and, and immigrant friendly environments in public schools in Texas and in New York. Now I'm talking about schools and I'm talking about education. We are not an education funder traditionally, but it was the fact that this innovation really took a bold and innovative approach in reaching immigrants and providing resources to thousands and thousands of immigrants through the school as, as a delivery mechanism. We thought that was boldly innovative and very appropriate to the Innovation Prize. So all that said, um, if your project is about a new strategy of brain cancer surgery, we are probably not gonna fund you because we don't do anything close to medicine nor solving the complex issues of cancer and cancer treatment. But I'm gonna tell you, if you're doing work that's in a manner related to the environment, social justice or heritage conservation, we use a pretty broad imagination to figure out things that may be tangentially related to that and therefore eligible for the prize. So again, use Justin's email if you have questions about that um, and I'll pass it back. Well, thanks Amy and shout out to those from Cleveland, Ohio, my hometown. Thank you, I'm glad you're here. Um, so here we are in 2021 and this is our fourth time running the prize. So as in 2015, 2017, and 2019, the 2021 prize will again award up to 10 prizes, each offering $50,000 per year for three years and a $25,000 bank of funds available for technical assistance at any time over that three-year period. Just as importantly, the fund staff provides significant non-monetary support to these innovators, including twice annual awardee convenings, of course, during non-pandemic times, um, in which awardees learn from each other and outside experts to provide both individualized coaching and group workshops that aim to lift all boats. I'll ask Tanisa to talk about her experience in just a few moments. So in 2021, we at the fund are again looking for individuals or teams representing nonprofit or for-profit organizations. I saw that question come through the chat, working on early stage projects that one, represent a game-changing answer to a clearly identified need. Two, are innovative within one or more of the fund's three program areas listed next to criteria on this slide. Three, demonstrate the potential to develop an actionable pilot or prototype with prize funding. And four, hold out the promise to benefit multiple individuals, communities, or sectors through a clearly articulated theory of change. In terms of geographic eligibility, and I saw Rex has been answering this question in the chat. Thank you, Rex. Um, an organization probably needs to be based in the US to be eligible. The door is slightly ajar, however, for non-US based programs, if there's a compelling case that the impact of the work could significantly benefit those in the United States. In 2015, only nonprofits, including those organizations or individuals with fiscal sponsors were eligible for the prize. But in 2017, we expanded our purview to also accept applications from mission-driven for-profit entities. We did this because we've seen a lot of really exciting social innovation taking place within organizational structures that are hybridized and don't neatly fit in the nonprofit bucket. So in 2021, we remain committed to the idea that socially focused for-profit organizations can require philanthropic seed capital to become economically viable in the marketplace. 
So to be clear, in the case that a for-profit again wins the prize, the fund would not expect an equity stake in the company, but would instead provide the organization with philanthropic grants, just as we do with nonprofit organizations. So now I feel like I've been talking forever, and I'm pleased to pass the mic to the wonderful, extraordinary Tanisa Islam, who will share her perspective on the prize as an actual recipient of the award. Tanisa? Thank you, Justin. Thank you for having me on. I'm living proof that everything Amy and Justin are talking about are in fact true. My name is Tanisa Islam. I'm the executive director of South Dakota Voices for Peace. Yes, people live in South Dakota. Our journey started really in 2017 where bigoted legislation was being brought to our state legislature. Since then, we have defeated 85% of bills targeting Muslims, immigrants, and refugees in rural conservative South Dakota. This work made me realize that we needed to do more in South Dakota to lift our communities into the power they have. And we created our C3 entity, South Dakota Voices for Peace, which received the Innovation Prize to really build power in our immigrant, refugee, and Muslim communities through storytelling, civic engagement, education, advocacy, and rapid response work. We are truly proof that progressive social justice work can win in rural conservative states, and we must take on that challenge to better our country as a whole. The running joke between us is when did I find out about the innovation price and how? Well, the story goes, I hadn't checked my voicemail in over a week, and I just happened to sit down and do it. And I had two voicemails from someone who was telling me to apply to the JMK Innovation Prize. Well, at my time, it was a prize of $175,000 over three, three years. And I said, well, I think I'm supposed to do this. The deadline was in two days and the rest is history. So most of you are from nonprofits. So I honestly don't have to explain the sheer joy and relief to receive multi-year unrestricted funding. The pandemic really put a spotlight on community organizations and the great need to fund leaders like us to do the work we know how to do. When a rapid response issue pops up, like when our county commission decided to cut 90% of interpreter funding in our largest district court, or the need for a local multilingual vaccine education, I can just do that work and I don't need to find funding to make it happen. In addition to the immense support from the JMK team, literally, they will help you with whatever you need. If you're like me, it's hard to make the ask when you're going 100 miles per hour with grassroots organizing, but I've started to make some asks and they've helped me create budgets, Excel spreadsheets, advice on board management and relationships as an executive director, wellness ideas for myself as well as my growing staff, innovative fundraising ideas, and just friendship in a sounding board. Our cohort has two others in the immigration organizing space, as Amy highlighted, one of them in schools. And it has been such a value added in our work to work with these partners now across the country. And of course, receiving this prestigious prize will increase your national visibility as it has for us. So please look at the application and know you can really do it in a day because we did and take the chance um, because the what you will receive is really unparalleled to any other type of fund or innovation prize that we've we've researched. Thanks for having me guys. Uh, Tanisa, you're amazing. Thank you so, so, so much for being here um, on today's webinar. And I really encourage everyone on today's information session to learn more about Tanisa and South Dakota Voices for Peace by visiting their website. You can also learn about uh, Tanisa and all of our other Innovation Prize awardees by visiting the fund's website and clicking on the Our Awardees pages under the JMK Innovation Prize tab. Amy, any additional reflections here? No, thank you, Tanisa. You're just such a great um, example of the kind of innovation that we hope to lift up. And, and um, I do encourage you to go, to, as Justin suggested, to our website and just click on the various links so you learn more about the diverse kinds of projects that we've been able to support through the Innovation Prize. 
um, it's really been a, a real joy for both me and Justin and everyone involved with this process. Um, so excited to, to go through another round with you, Justin. Yay. All right, Tunisia, I hope you'll hang with us to answer some questions uh, later in this webinar. All right, cool. So let's dig into eligibility criteria. And next slide, please. So again, the three funding areas are social justice, the environment, and heritage conservation. Let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. So I think it probably makes sense, Amy, for us to talk about some project types that are in fact ineligible in hopes that this provides additional clarity uh, to prospective applicants. So Amy, I'll pass the mic to you to go first. Sure, so if an organization's sole purpose is the development of research, you're probably not eligible for the prize. We've received a lot of high quality research proposals in the past, um, but this prize really seeks action and real life impact. Now that's not to say that research can't be a component of the project that's proposed. It just needs to be that the research is actually applied in the, in the, in the work of the organization. Justin? That's right. And if a project's primary purpose is the promotion of religious doctrine, also not eligible for the prize. That said, we certainly welcome applications from organizations with a religious affiliation or bent, but the primary purpose of a project cannot be evangelizing. Amy? Sure, and if an organization is no longer at an early stage of development, it's probably not eligible for the prize. Now, this one's a little bit subjective, right? There's some flexibility, but we're most interested in organizations that were founded less than four years ago. Uh, so if you're, I'll tell you one thing, we can generally sense that if your organization has millions of dollars in the bank and lots of staff members, you're probably too mature for the prize and really um, that uh, this prize being more focused on early stage, early stage organization and ventures. Justin? Yeah. yeah, and relatedly, if a program is under the umbrella of a larger organization with no plans to become a standalone entity, probably ineligible. We fully appreciate that innovation takes place within established organizations. That said, we believe that these small projects within established organizations, if they have merit, can often find funding from other sources. It's really not the intention of the innovation prize. We will, however, entertain applications for pilot projects within established organizations if there's interest or intention for that project to spin out on its own, if successful. So if a project doesn't focus on impact within the United States, um, it's probably not eligible for the prize. Now, Justin mentioned earlier that generally speaking, an organization must be US-based to apply. But the nuance here is that if your organization um, is internationally focused and your project will have a direct impact on the United States, let me give you an example of this. And this is typical in our heritage conservation work where so much of the work that we do here in the United States was inspired by work that originates from other parts of the country. Um, if, a, if a French organization that has an innovative practice wants to bring that to the United States and practice it here, that work would be eligible for the prize. Justin? Great. I'm getting distracted by all the good questions coming in through the chat. So I'll try not to answer them now and continue with our narrative here. Um, so right, ineligibility. If a founder has no intention of making his or her organization a full-time commitment, probably ineligible. So the prize provides general operating support, which sometimes gets used for the founder's salary, and we are totally okay with that. But we want work with social innovators who are dedicated to their project and spending most of their time on it. So. Thanks for your help, Amy. I hope this was helpful, everyone. Let's advance to the next slide. So this is our next to last slide uh, before we get into Q&A, and it provides a timeline for the 2021 prize. So the round one application is live now on the fund's website, jmkfund.org, and the submission deadline is April 30th. This application is purposefully short and sweet, as Tanisa alluded to, removing all philanthropy jargon. We really hope to save applicants time by using a multi-stage application process. Then more than 500 volunteer reviewers will read and score these applications for the fund with each application being read by at least four reviewers and sometimes uh, up to 10. So based on this review, 20% of round one applicants will be invited to submit a round two application by July 9th. 
And this is more like a traditional grant application. So it's slightly longer. It asks questions about budget, foreseeable obstacles to success, and more. There's also a request to upload a short video. Please don't stress about this. Uh, most videos are made on a phone looking up a person's nose, and we are totally cool with that. Um, the round two review is then conducted in late summer by 30 plus subject matter experts who review applications individually and then together in pairs, coming to a consensus on the top ideas in their area of expertise. From there, about 60 applicants are invited to join Skype calls with Amy, me, and our colleagues at the fund. Ultimately, 15 finalists are flown to New York City, COVID permitting, in September to meet with the fund's trustees, where 10 awardees will be selected. And then a public announcement of the awardees is made in November of 2021, with the first cohort meeting taking place in the spring of 2022. Next slide, please. So we find the JMK Innovation Prize incredibly exciting and hope you feel inspired to get involved in some way. That's right. At the end of the day, we are a fairly small family foundation and we really rely on the generosity of you all. Our network um, of great friends and colleagues across the country, you guys really help us make this happen and we are so, so grateful for your participation. That's right. And beyond applying, which of course we encourage you to do if you're eligible, here are three ways you can get involved. One, help us spread the word with your professional and personal networks. And if you're hip, which I'm not, uh, and use social media with the hashtag, hashtag JMK Innovation Prize, or use our Twitter handle at the JMK Fund. Two, while we don't accept nominations per se, there is a question in the round one application in which applicants can optionally state who referred them to the prize. Um, so, you know, we encourage these more personal referrals to write in your name so we can connect them back to you. And three, please volunteer to be a round one volunteer reviewer. We refer to these folks as smart generalists. Um, in a post prize survey, the feedback we received from 2019 reviewers was exceptional. People loved this experience of getting a taste of social and environmental innovation taking place across the country. This takes approximately six hours of time. If you received an email about this webinar, please be on the lookout for another email in the coming weeks with a link to the registration form. And Jean, answering your question from just a moment ago, yes, you can be both an applicant and a reviewer to the prize. So with that, we're gonna to transition to questions and answers, uh, but please feel free to email me, Justin, directly at the email address listed on the screen. There's also more great information available on the Kaplan Fund's website, jmkfund.org. So Amy, Tuniza, and I will now field questions. If you have a question, now is the time to type it into the chat box. We're also gonna to refer to the questions that were submitted before today's webinar uh, via email. So let's take a deep breath, team. Uh, thanks everyone for sticking with us. Um, Amy, I'm gonna direct the first question to you if that's okay. Great. Can an organization apply to the prize if they've previously or currently received funding from the JM Kaplan Fund? So yes, I mean, we try to keep a very open door at the Innovation Prize, but if you previously applied, and we're an early stage organization. And since we only do this prize every two years, I just remind you that we're looking still for those early stage organizations. And now you're a couple of years past the, the point you were when you first applied for it. But that said, we, we, we encourage people to apply and uh, welcome your applications. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Tanisa, this one uh, is for you. Um, what has been the biggest divergence between your expectations when first receiving the prize versus your actual experience? I mean, I have never received so much support from a funder before. Um, I regularly receive emails from Justin connecting me with other funders nationally, other opportunities to talk about our work on a national stage. Um, and that is something I, I truly didn't expect and has really done amazing things about our visibility uh, on a national platform. Thanks, Tanisa. Um, I'll take the next one. It looks like there have been some questions about the monetary award of the prize, um, 175,000 versus 50,000 for three years, plus technical assistance. So yes, both are correct. The total monetary prize is $175,000 over three years. It's paid out 
$50,000 per year for three years. And then there's a $25,000 for technical assistance fund, which we can talk about more. If you have questions, please email us in that you can use at any time over that three year period. So $175,000 is the monetary award of the prize. Next question. Um, let's see, there are so many questions. Um, <laughs> Amy, um, is one allowed to submit more than one application to the prize? I mean, sure. I mean, I, I, I wish I had that many innovative ideas, but yes, we welcome people to make um, as many applications as they feel they can be, be competitive with. So um, bring it all on. We're excited to hear about the innovation that's out there. Thanks, Amy. Um, a few questions, which is amazing from local governments or regional governments um, asking if they are eligible for the prize. Um, so I'm going to say yes, but there's some nuance here. Um, so we really envision the innovation prize being about 50% idea and 50% the human beings that are behind that idea. And as you've heard from Tunisia, um, the fund offers sort of professional and organizational development opportunities. And those opportunities are really much focused on those that are leading nonprofit or mission-driven for-profit organizations, thinking about board building, thinking about um, fundraising, thinking about succession planning. So we've never had a local government win the prize, but I think we're open to it. Um, Amy, I see you nodding. Do you agree with this? Yeah, I mean, we, we know that critical innovation happens within local and um, larger scale government. I think the goal though, as, as Justin said, is really we envision these efforts often to be incubated out of either a larger organization, I suppose it could be incubated out of government and then spinning out. So I'll use the example of an organization here in New York City that was a nonprofit that was started by New York City Parks. It's a, a organization that manage a, a series of city owned properties. That eventually rolled out to become its own nonprofit, which is the Historic House Trust of New York City. That, that would be a perfect example of a kind of organization that, that might've been birthed within government, but then um, ultimately fledged out on its own. So that, that's the way I see that path, Justin. Maybe you have more to add. No, I think that covers it. Um, so yeah, if you're a local government or a county government interested in the prize and have questions, please email us and happy to connect with you. Um, let's see, Amy, it seems like there might be some confusion between the fund's traditional grant making, which is um, mm -hmm. by invitation only, versus right. the JMK Innovation Prize, which is an open call grant making initiative. Would you mind maybe adding more color to that? Sure. So we're, we are still a pretty small and traditional small family foundation. And so really we made a decision several years ago not to have uh, a, an open call for applications, mostly because we didn't want grantees putting a ton of effort into something that was not likely to be funded. So all of our traditional grant making done by our grant officers is by invitation. Um, we have very specific and narrow areas that we fund. We're pretty targeted to only ask people to apply for things that we're pretty confident are gonna be funded. What's great about the Innovation Prize, it's the polar opposite of that, that every two years we open the door to innovation and try to reach as far and wide for that innovation as possible. So this is once every two years, we do this open call and then the rest of our grant making is by invitation only. Awesome, Tanisa, I think you're getting off easy. A uh, question for you <laughs> is, could you provide an example of like a collaboration or relationship um, with another awardee that you built through the cohort experience? I might call out, this is sort of an unfair question because Tanisa's class has actually never met in person besides when they were interviewing in New York City because of the pandemic. So we at the fund have done our best to sort of provide um, virtual programming, uh, which I think has been pretty successful, but nothing really replaces being together in person. So, you know, pending the rollout of the vaccine, we're really hoping to get everyone together in this cohort in person together in the fall. Um, so anyway, with that long preface, Tanisa. Yeah, um, actually we've, we've partnered with another cohort member. She is a professor um, at Villanueva, right? Um, in Villanova, sorry, Villanova. <laughs> she created um, a program called VISTA, which is to equip non-lawyers to be immigration court advocates. 
Um, and as you can imagine, in South Dakota, we only have seven immigration attorneys. So this type of program would be very impactful in rural communities like ours. So we um, have a legal services arm to our work. I'm an immigration attorney. We provide free ser legal services to unaccompanied minors from Central America who are here, as well as um, victims of violence who are immigrants and undocumented. So our team is very new to this space. And so it just worked out that the VISTA program was launching around the same time as our team was getting their feet wet. And so now they're part of that program, getting all of that education. They were eligible for a scholarship through that program too. So it was minimal cost to us. Um, and hopefully it'll be a great story when it's done. I love that. Thank you, Tunisa. Um, maybe also a difficult question. Amy, I'll direct this one to you. Uh, <laughs> so I don't have to answer it. Um, are there certain types of projects that you hope to receive this year as opposed to previous funding cycles? Look, I'm going to just say that we have been delighted and surprised by some extraordinary innovation that's come through this prize in every single round. And we want you to knock our socks off again this year with ideas that we could never have anticipated. So what we're really looking for are things that we couldn't have imagined, right? And we're looking uh, I'll use the example in democracy for some really disruptive new ideas that can really accelerate voter engagement, voter education, counter voter suppression. We're really hoping that innovation can, can provide some much needed sort of new, new energy and new um, ideas for the field. Thank you, Amy. Uh, well said. Um, just so many great questions. Yes, if you're in Puerto Rico or US territory, please apply. Um, we'd love to see your application. Applications from native tribes, indigenous tribes. Yes, totally eligible. Please. Um, Jenny, to answer your question about repeating sort of the 50% individual, 50% organization, this is how we at the fund sort of conceptualize the prize as 50% supporting the idea and its development and 50% the individual. And that's why we have this very personalized relationship with our grantees of the prize. That's why we offer um, workshops that focus on both organizational and professional development. Um, one of the things that we at the fund do is provide a chaplain um, who's available to awardees of the prize at no cost. So if someone wants to have a conversation with someone about what's happening in their life, we know that social entrepreneurs carry a lot of weight um, of the work that they do they're able to access that resource. Um, and that's somewhat unusual for um, funders of nonprofits and mission-driven for-profits. Um, there's a question about if Kaplan serves as a fiscal sponsor. No, but you can apply as an individual. And um, if your application is successful through a couple rounds of the selection process, we will connect you with a fiscal sponsor um, so that the actual payment of the award goes to the fiscal sponsor because we can't fund individuals directly. Amy, there's a question about what does early stage heritage look like? Can you give an example of an early stage heritage uh, project? Please give me an example of an early stage heritage. No, um, we, we, we have had really fascinating submissions in this space. And um, I think there's a lot of work going on around um, increasing the diversity of the field and expanding the definitions of what cultural resource means to going from a building centric to a more people centric interpretation. I think there's just tons of, of really good work happening in this space. And I think we're also interested in, and this is a great example of an area that in a manner related to, we know a lot of people come to heritage conservation, heritage preservation through very different lenses, right? You could come to it as an entrepreneur, you could come to it as a social um, as a social justice advocate. And I, I wanna touch on Kat's question in the Q and A, which is uh, in the chat, which is about being able to check more than one box. Do not hesitate. If, you're, if your project sits with a foot in heritage conservation and a foot in social justice, check those boxes um, because it gives us a chance to review and look at that proposal from multiple perspectives. So we encourage that. And one of the things I love about the prize is that one of our early ideas about this was to go for those kinds of projects that sit in sort of the interstitial spaces between traditional siloed giving areas. We're trying to break silos and look at hybrid solutions. So please, please check multiple boxes. We like that a lot. All right, well done, Amy. I'm just 
slightly overwhelmed by all the good questions coming in. So I think we probably need to cap it in about five minutes, but a couple others that have come in um, that I think are, are pretty interesting. One is asking about age of innovators. And if you are someone in uh, your 60s, do you have a chance? And the answer is yes. Um, I think legally we can't have anyone under the age of 18, but if you're under the age of 18 and have an innovative idea, we could probably find workarounds. And we do have innovators in all of our classes um, that I'd say are of a certain age. So maybe check out the jmkfund.org website and take a look at the videos from all of our previous awardees and you can get a sense of the diversity in all respects of our 30 previous awardees. And we anticipate that to continue in 2021 as well. Dustin, are we allowed to say that we've had age ranges as great as 50 years between awardees? That's true. Let's tell that story. I love Let's that tell story. That story. <laughs> all right. So in our first cohort, um, we had someone who was currently in college, which is fairly common. And we had someone who had run multiple museums um, and founded multiple museums who was in her 60s. Um, and it actually ended up being this really beautiful relationship where the person in the 60s could work with the person who was younger on social media strategy. Um, and the younger person um, really found mentorship in the person who had much more experience in nonprofit management. Um, so we love those stories. So thanks for bringing that up, Amy. Um, Justin, do you want to take on that really hard question of what is innovation? No. To me, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I mean, listen, million dollar question. The good news is that Amy and I aren't the ones making the decisions, right? So we rely on 500 external reviewers in round one. We rely on 30 subject matter experts in the respective disciplines in round two. And our trustees make the ultimate decision going from 15 to 10 awardees. Um, so not to pass the buck, but we rely on a lot of outside folks to help inform that. I think in the case of recent awardees, I would say something like geography can be innovation. So what is happening in New York City is not happening in South Dakota. So a South Dakota, the fact that Denise is doing the work that she's doing in a rural area, I think makes it extremely innovative. Um, parts of Denise's work in New York City, maybe not so much. Um, so I think there's that lens. I think there's a disciplinary lens. Um, I think there's like a methodological lens that we've seen has been an interesting way to differentiate innovation. I don't know, Amy, did that, was that no, sufficient? I think that's great. And I do think Tanisa is one of the greatest examples. Tanisa, um, do you reflect on what you do versus what you've heard some of your less rural colleagues doing and how that affects your lens on innovation? Yeah, absolutely. Not innovative to lift immigrants and refugees, but we're literally the only ones doing it right now in South Dakota. And we hope to build that blueprint, right? A blueprint to how to do this work in rural conservative communities. I would just add, um, if you think it's innovative, make your case. Yeah. Right? You're the one who can really delineate why your idea is innovative for where you are. So. Yeah, I love that, Tanisa. Well said. All right, so last few questions here, um, and thanks again for everyone's engagement. This has been really tremendous. Um, reporting requirements, Jennifer. So we pride ourselves in having very few reporting requirements. Um, at the end of the three-year cycle, we do ask, I think, 15 questions that we ask every awardee to reflect on in sort of a write-up that's usually between three and five pages. But we don't do annual reporting. Um, we think you guys have much better things to be doing <laughs> than writing reports to us. I will say, though, that we're also non-traditional and that we're in frequent touch with Tanisa and her colleagues. So we have regular calls, one-on-one um, -on -one and group calls. In normal times, we'd be doing site visits and actually spending time with Tanisa in South Dakota. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case uh, because of the pandemic, but we hope to make up for it later this year. All right. Any other questions that we are seeing here, people, that we feel are mission critical to respond to in this moment? So many good questions, but you know, I think it is now 45 minutes in. I feel innovation prize uh, love from everyone that's here. I wanna thank Amy and Tanisa for your involvement today. I wanna thank Rex for being the magic behind the scene and running the technology today, which has been flawless. Um, I want to thank Allison, our fabulous interpreter, for making this content accessible to our Spanish-speaking friends. Um, and if you have any questions, please email us at innovationprize at jmkfund.org, and we look forward to receiving your application. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Please apply. <laughs>